Well, thank you guys for for coming tonight, like always. Great turnout, and and we really appreciate your support of our CE series. Um, Most important, I, as as, uh, head of our oncology service here, really really appreciate all your support that you've given us over the last several years uh, here uh, at MBS for our oncology unit. Um, We have certainly had... Uh, a, a great four years. We've seen a lot of cases, been able to help a lot of dogs, and that's all due to your support. And I look forward to working with you more in the future. Tonight, uh, we, so I was going through trying to figure out what to talk about. I just decided to jump on probably the biggest topic that I get questions about every day and, and certainly one of the most common, if not the most common, cancers that we see on our service and, and treat every day. I'm going to try to go over certainly some new developments in this field, some new things that are out there for treatment and diagnosis uh, and diagnostics for <laughs> lymphoma, as well as go over a lot of uh, just a summary over known things about the disease to really kind of freshen your Uh, freshen your memory on lymphoma. Starting out, we just start with really highlighting how common this disease is. If if we look at all the dogs in this world and we talk about what they're going to likely pass away, what's the biggest health concern that we see in dogs across the world, it's not orthopedic disease or heart disease. It's actually going to be cancer. Uh, about 48 to 50 percent of dogs in this world will be diagnosed with cancer by the age of 10. And if we look at the most common cancers that we see, about 15 to 25 percent of those cancers that are diagnosed will be canine lymphoma. If we look at certainly the most common hemopoietic disease, lymphoma is very top of that list at, at over 80 percent. It obviously originates from lymphocytes, and those are going to be found in any lymphoid tissue. So lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, bone marrow, these are all locations where lymphoma can generate from. The most common is obviously in the lymph nodes. It's typically considered a systemic disease. I want to take this opportunity right here when we say that it's considered a systemic disease and just highlight a a couple similarities and and terms that we use in the human side and relate that to the veterinary side. So in humans you'll hear a lot about two different forms of lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's was actually a a human doctor, a human oncologist, and, and he would see human patients that came in with lymphoma that had a more solitary form of the disease, a mass if you will. Those forms are very isolated, solitary masses. They do exist in the canine world. They're just, they're just rare. They're just ones that we don't see a lot. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more of that multiple uh, mass or multiple lymph node enlargement disease courses. It's what we see in our field. So canine lymphoma is roughly would be referred to on the human side as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The signalment for dogs with lymphoma are going to be middle to older aged, however they can be of any age. The youngest dog I've ever seen with lymphoma was about five months old. Um, It certainly has been documented younger than that. It's been documented as young as about three and a half to four years old. But I saw a dog one time that was not quite six months old yet. The sex uh, predisposition, there's not really one. There's a couple papers that highlighted that that female may have a better prognosis when treated. It's definitely not what I see. I mean, I I don't see that, that males versus females have a difference in their survival time. But there is certainly a breed predisposition, as, as many of us know and have seen in, in clinics. <clears throat> if we look at just genetic tendencies or, or potential predispositions, certainly the two poster childs for lymphoma are going to be boxers and golden retrievers. We see, obviously, a very large number of golden retrievers every year diagnosed with lymphoma, as well as boxers. Some of the lesser known but common dogs that we'll run across that may have a, a familial tendency are going to be bull mastiffs, basset hounds, Airedales, bulldogs, Scottish terriers, those are all listed at least as potentially having a genetic predisposition. Something a lot of people don't realize is there's a couple breeds out there that actually have a a really low incidence of lymphoma and those are going to be dachshunds and pomeranians. Now I will say I've seen some pomeranians but I see very few dachshunds with lymphoma. It's it's interesting. I've I've always been a fan of dachshunds but I think that those are going to be seen by the neurology service, not my service. So it's, uh, it, at least not for lymphoma. The, uh, <clears throat> the etiology is largely unknown in dogs. There's, there's certainly cer- some thoughts that, that there may be, again, that genetic tendency. And with the development of the Canine Genome Project and the Human Genome Project, as we compared dogs with lymphomas and looked at their genetic profile and looked at healthy dogs, what we found was that there, there are similar chromosomal abnormalities noted in those dogs that have lymphoma that is really consistent 
consistent across diagnosed dogs, and those abnormalities or, or chromosomal defects are not noted on the on the healthy dog side. So we think that that certainly we don't really know what causes those chromosomal defects, but we certainly think that could be a link to the development of the disease. The Loose association I commented here on is really from humans. Uh, so, so there has been a couple things in the human side that has been linked to cause lymphoma. I grew up on a farm and, and we used a lot of 2,4-D when I was a kid. It's a, it's a defoliant that's going to knock the leaves off of soybeans or cotton. If you're going in to pick cotton or thrash soybeans, you're, you're going to try to get those leaves off so it's a, it's a, cleaner, um, a cleaner harvest. So 2,4-D is something that's commonly used, broadleaf herbicide. It is falling out of favor and not used as much now. But 2,4-D as well as the more potent form of it, 2,4-ST, which is roughly referred to now as Agent Orange, was used heavily in, in Vietnam and a lot of soldiers that came back that were exposed to 2,4-ST over the years did go on and develop leukemias and lymphomas. They certainly think that the, the exposure to that herbicide could have had some, uh, some significant effects on those soldiers and, and was linked uh, in the late 70s to uh, a lot of people developing uh, lymphoma later in life. And so those two things have been exposed and or have been linked to potential uh, uh, hazards in developing the disease. Obviously it's not something that we see in dogs. We don't see a lot of dogs exposed to, to 2,4-D or 2,4-ST. So it's just something that's interesting. I always like to throw those, those historic facts into these talks because I think it's cool to, to go back in time and see what, you know, we'll learn about the diseases and not just what we do about them but how, we, how they develop in the first place. There is potentially a possible association with a weak immune system. I think the industrial area is a, is a pretty light, uh, a light thing. It's only been noted in a couple papers. But the weakened immune system is something that's real. And, and it's not even that it's maybe inducing lymphoma, but it certainly may have a, a big effect in controlling lymphoma when we start treating it. And we're going to talk a whole lot about that immune system later as we talk about different treatment options. Various types of lymphoma that are out there. The most common form of lymphoma that we see is, is multicentric lymphoma or, or lymph node or nodal lymphoma. Other forms that we'll talk briefly about tonight are GI lymphoma, cutaneous lymphoma, uh, mediastinal lymphoma, and then finally I'm going to hit on just a couple things about CNS or central nervous system lymphoma. But the big one we'll start with is, is going to be nodal lymphoma. And when we look at what we call staging lymphoma or, or trying to determine the extent of involvement a patient may have, we refer to this scheme right here. This is called the WHO or the World Health Organization staging scheme. Your, your nodal lymphomas are going to be really highlighted in the first three categories, one, two, and three, because those are exclusively isolated to just lymph nodes. So you either have a single lymph node or stage two would be a couple lymph nodes or regional lymphadenopathy, which is just above or below the diaphragm, meaning that the disease is really isolated only half the body. Stage one and two is, is really rarely noted. Uh, I do see patients that have stage one or two, and it's probably that we just picked up on it early on. But there's not a ton of statistics or a lot of prognostic factors linked to just those two because they are more rare. We really work and function in stage three and stage four. So stage three is just that generalized lymphadenopathy. The dog comes in, he's got a big submandibular lymph node, he's got a big popliteal lymph node, or all of the lymph nodes are big. Stage four is that you have liver and spleen involvement. Now this is a real important stage because there's a lot of misconceptions about what that means. The reason stage four exists, the reason we have that stage, is because there is statistically very little difference between a dog that has liver and spleen involvement and a dog that does not have liver and spleen involvement. Now the reason that is is because when I give you medication, when I give you a steroid or I give you chemotherapy, vincristine, doxorubicin, cytoxin, it heavily, heavily penetrates into that liver and spleen as soon as I give it to you. When we start talking about stage five, the reason skin is not good and bone marrow is not good and brain is not good and lungs are not good and eyes are not good is because those are really, really protected areas. It's really hard to get the drug into those areas. And so if you can't get the drug to the disease, you can't be effective at treating it. The reason stage four dogs, if we compared a dog that had big lymph nodes everywhere and a dog that had big lymph nodes and liver and spleen involved, the reason that stage four has very little difference in his prognosis is because as soon as I give you that drug, it hits the liver, boom, as soon as it goes through that bloodstream and it starts clearing that disease from those two places. So 
Stage 3 and stage 4, we, we break 4 out away from all of these other locations in the body which are going to be put into that stage 5 because prognostically those dogs can still do very, very well. So highlight that is, is really if you see a dog that comes in and you're like, wow, he's got a huge liver and a huge spleen and big lymph nodes, it doesn't necessarily mean he won't do well. Now, when you leave the liver and spleen and you start saying, wow, his lungs have disease in it, or he's got, and I have seen this multiple times, he's got lymphocytes floating in the chambers of his eyes. He's got so much disease. He's having seizures. That's a different story because those guys do have a much guarded prognosis because it's really hard to get into those protected areas and get that disease cleared. So the, the staging schemes, what do you really want to know about it? Well, know that three and four is where most of the statistics come from. We don't pad the statistics and say a dog's going to live a year, year and a half with lymphoma, but only if he's got stage one. We don't do that. I mean, it's three and four. And, and know that that four, those dogs can still do really, really well when you look at treating them. But the most common presentation that you'll see is just the stage three, big lymph nodes. So the dog comes in typically feeling great, bouncing around, but the owners say, you know, I was, I was petting on him last night and I felt this big giant lymph node. And you start feeling around and go, yeah, they're all big. So that's going to be your typical presentation. So it's usually referred to as a substage A or asymptomatic. You can be ill. Obviously, if the disease has been there a little while and started to progress, you can certainly be clinically ill. And those signs can in include a whole bunch of stuff. Real, real kind of just, just vague signs. So everything from not eating, being lethargic, having some weight loss, to it's really starting to progress and I've got, it, I've got heavy infiltration in my liver and spleen and I'm developing ascites from it. Or, or maybe I've got hypercalcemia, which I'm going to talk a lot about it. I've got polyuria and polydipsia. And then maybe it's in my bone marrow and I've already just started to develop a fever and anemia from that. But I would say that by far and away your common presentation is just simply lymphadenopathy. You see that dog that comes in, he's otherwise healthy and you feel those big lymph nodes. Best thing you want to tell an owner, the most important thing is the number one cause for a healthy, otherwise healthy dog to have big lymph nodes is lymphoma. It's not fungal, it's not rickettsial, it's not, it's, it's certainly not, um, you know, these foreign big crazy bacterial diseases. But what it is going to be is lymphoma. That's certainly going to be the top of your list. If I see those cases and, and I'm thinking as an oncologist, uh, lymphoma, is it wrong to say I'm going to take a sample but in the meantime I'm going to put you on doxycycline? No, not at all. But I think that certainly when you feel or find a dog with big lymph nodes, you're thinking lymphoma. The first step for you is to take an aspiration of that lymph node. Most lymphomas are going to be able to be easily diagnosed off cytology alone. I will say that as the years have went on and now we're in a different time period with our pathologists, which absolutely I guarantee all of you guys have experienced this in the last few years, they like to do what I call waffle. Um, you get more and more of this every year and I have no idea why, but, but maybe it's just kind of a cover your butt situation that they're in. But I felt like when I went through my residency, pathologists would go, this is lymphoma. You know, this is this is what I'm thinking. I mean, there's some cells there, but this is lymphoma. You know, they would tell you what they really felt. Now it's kind of more of this can report of possibly emerging lymphoma. Can't rule out reactive. Blah 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 blah. So you you just have to. You also have to just put that together with your history. Um, you're looking for a uniform population. So so what I tell clients and when I'm talking to them is that. When you look at lymphoma and compare it to a reactive lymph node, a reactive lymph node is due to the, the immune system trying to target something. They're trying to go after a, a, a virus or a bacteria. They're trying to respond to some inflammatory substance in the body. So it's kind of like you're battling or fighting a war. You're going to send people from all branches of the military. So you're going to have big lymphocytes and small lymphocytes and middle side lymphocytes and neutrophils and a little bit of everything in that lymph node. If you're looking at lymphoma, it's one cell that got damaged and he's sitting there making clones of himself. And so they all are this nice, big cell, uniform population. They're all looking the same. How can that be hard to, to differentiate? Well, it just depends on how many of those big cells are there. If you're diagnosing it really early, you can go like, I don't see a lot of intermediates. I see a bunch of big ones and then there's some normal ones. That's that emerging population they're talking about. Most of the time they look at it and go, the predominance here is definitely big lymphocytes. So if we look at this, this is kind of one of those emerging populations. You've got a bunch of little ones that are scattered in here and then you've got these big ones. And you're thinking, wow, those are all, there's a lot of big ones there and then there's some small ones. But then you start to get into this where like they're all big. I mean, they're all starting to hit into that big category. So I think cytology is still the best step, first step to take. And a lot of times you will get that diagnosis pretty quick. 
The other things that I do is obviously you just start with the minimum database. CBC, chemistry, your analysis. <clears throat> what are you looking for? Well, CBC, you're, you're just looking for anything that really is super concerning, anemia, thrombocytopenia, something that might push you into thinking that you have a bone marrow involvement or you have a more systemic aggressive process. The big ones that I'm looking for are really on the chemistry panel. So certainly something we'll talk a lot about is this hypercalcemia. The number one cause for hypercalcemia in a dog is cancer, and the number one cancer to cause hypercalcemia in a dog is lymphoma. Uh, so this is something we should check for. I'm going to talk a lot about it, but about 25% of dogs with lymphoma will have hypercalcemia. You will see hyperproteinemia or hypergammaglobulinemia. The uh, elevation in globulins can be linked to a, 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 a antibody producing or immunoglobulin producing form of lymphoma. Those are things just to kind of get an idea of your baseline or where you're starting from. This is something a lot of people don't know. Uh, when dogs have lymphoma, they have about a 40% chance or more that they can develop a UTI. It's just one of those kind of gee whiz facts that you see when dogs are going through treatment. And so if you're about to immunosuppress them with chemotherapy or put them on a lot of steroids, it is important to know, do you have a UTI going into it? Now, I will be first to tell you, I, I definitely do not collect urine on every single dog with lymphoma. Maybe they come in, they got a small bladder and I can't get urine. But if I can, I think it's important because certainly it's probably one of those things where we don't do enough. Uh, these guys just have a weakened immune system and a lot of times can have something like a UTI going on. When we look at that minimum database, though, hypercalcemia is probably the big one. Uh, that's the one that we will run into, and, and it is certainly something that we need to take note of, as well as potentially address right, you know, right away. A lot of the other stuff, like the, the anemia, the thrombocytopenia, as you start to treat the disease, that should improve. This will too, but this can be more life-threatening and in the immediate period. Again, like I said, about 10 to 35 percent, or I roughly usually say about 25 percent of patients with lymphoma will have hypercalcemia. There's some, certainly some types that are more common. So thymic or mediastinal lymphoma are a little bit more common to induce hypercalcemia. T-cell variations of the disease have been certainly linked to a higher risk of hypercalcemia, and it is considered a negative prognostic indicator. The reason it's a negative prognostic indicator is because certainly it means that you're in that, that, that clinical stage. You're actually having clinical signs. You're not just asymptomatic for it. There's certainly different levels of hypercalcemia, though, in dogs, and not all hypercalcemia is equivocal. The majority of patients you see are going to be in this category right here, this mild to moderate. Mild to moderate is, is not a huge deal. It means that if you're sick from it and you're not doing really well and you got that high calcium, maybe I give you a little diuresis and, and flush your system out, get that calcium to reduce. Uh, maybe we start you on a little steroids or even a little Lasix to help that process along the way. But that's about the extent of what you need to do. The severe category, when you run across one of these guys, it is different. That means that you're having some pretty significant signs from your hypercalcemia. Arrhythmias, muscle fasciculation, severe weakness, maybe you even have a seizure. So these are categories where you may need to up the ante and not just rehydrate them or put them on the steroids. You may have to tap into something like a bisphosphonate to bind that calcium up or calcintonin that will drive it out of that bloodstream into the cells. Those are rare. We do not do that much. Even the number of lymphoma patients I see on a year-to-year -year basis, I mean, we will do it once a year, if that. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare. It's rare to have to go to that extent because the number one important thing with treating hypercalcemia is treat the lymphoma. So no matter how much diuresis you do, no matter how much you do to lower that calcium, you have to correct the cause of it. And the cause of it is, is the cancer cells themselves will produce a protein that appears to have the same effects as your parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone related peptide or related protein mimics PTH and it will cause a false elevation in your calcium. It's, a, it's actually a real elevation but it's tricking the body into thinking it needs to increase its calcium. Uh, so what you're seeing is, is that those cancer cells are producing that. If you can eliminate the cancer cells, get the lymphoma under control, you stop producing PTHRP and therefore that calcium will go ahead and regulate and everything will get back to normal. So you have to treat your lymphoma to get the calcium under control long term. So when I have a patient that comes in, for example, and has a really high calcium, maybe they're showing some mild clinical signs, I'll put them on fluids, start them on steroids, because I'm going to do that anyway with their lymphoma, and start their treatment. And watch them overnight, and usually that calcium will start going back to normal, and then get them home, and that's usually what we need to do. The reality of it is, is 
the fluids are one of those deals that will help them feel better, help that lower that calcium. But the basis of my treatment for hypercalcemia with lymphoma patients is treating the lymphoma. After we check out the minimum database, we've done our cytology and we're really feeling like feeling pretty comfortable this is lymphoma, and we just do our, our kind of initial staging. One of the big things I was going to highlight is, is taking chest rads. Some people do, some people don't, and, and it's really important to take chest rads in a, a dog with lymphoma and also know what you're looking for. Lymphoma is one of those interesting ones. It doesn't have those big chunky uh, metastatic nodules like you think with a sarcoma or carcinoma. You see more of this just snowstorm, hazy, miliary pattern. These cells are just floating in that bloodstream. They're kind of just accumulating in the small vessels in the lungs, and it results in this just really marked, just very small miliary type pattern throughout the lungs. You can also see lymph node enlargement in the chest, so you can have perihilar lymphadenopathy, sternal, you can have those mediastinal masses, so it's good to, to get an idea of where you're starting from and get a baseline. There's two reasons for that. One is you want to know just where you are in this disease process, so as things move forward you get a better idea, is, is my chemotherapy working and it's resolving or is it not working and this wasn't there when I started and now it is and it's, it's progressing in the face of the drugs I'm using. And Then you also want to know just the level of disease you have as you start treatment because when you start treating this, if you have a really, real high level of, of disease, you'll hear people talk about a syndrome called tumor lysis syndrome. And I didn't put a slide in here on this, and I thought later that I definitely should have, but tumor lysis syndrome is the fact that when it comes to lymphoma, we really don't have a problem with the response we get. Our drugs work. As soon as we start treating these dogs, even with prednisone, they respond. Lymph nodes start to reduce. They feel better. Everybody's happy. Our problem with lymphoma is something we're going to talk about later, and that's keeping them in remission. But these dogs respond, and oftentimes they respond really, really well, especially if you're putting chemotherapy on board. If you have a ton of disease in the lungs, big lymph nodes everywhere, and you start treating them really aggressively with your drug, they can have an acute death of all of those cancer cells virtually at one time, and when they die, they just break open and release all their contents. Uric acid from the DNA breaking apart, hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, and your body gets this rush of all of these electrolytes and it can become really, really life-threatening and have a lot of clinical issues. So again, cardiac abnormalities, marked lethargy, acute death, I mean definitely have seen it. It's rare. It's going to make up about 6% of patients that are treated, and I don't think the number's even that high. I think it's lower than that. But knock on wood, I mean, we, we just don't see a lot of it. But if I have a dog that has tons and tons and tons of disease, believe I'm having that conversation with the owners about what to look for. Because what can we do? Well, the best thing we can do if we know you have a heavy burden of disease is, again, put you in the hospital, put you on fluids, and just flush, 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 flush. The reason we're flushing you out and diuresing you is just like with that high calcium. We can get rid of those electrolytes, get things back to normal, and help the body get rid of those cells as they die off. We can also take, you, take it a little bit easier with your drugs. I may not hit you with the same level of intensity right on the start. I might try to go for a little slower death of some of those cells, which is easier said than done because you have such a, a narrow window window with your chemo, it either works or it doesn't. I mean, you kind of you, you kind of have a little bit less control there. But certainly getting those x-rays, that's, that's where you can have a lot of disease hiding. You can definitely have a lot of disease hiding in those lungs and, those, and, and getting a baseline again, like I said, from just where you're starting from will have you a little better idea of what to expect as you move forward with treatment. Now, tumor lysis syndrome is only going to be a real big concern with your first treatment. And you're usually going to see it within about 48 hours if you, if you see it at all. If the dogs do well with that first treatment, then it's rare that you're going to see any kind of major issues on two, three, or four as you go on down the road. When we look at staging a dog for lymphoma, this is a big one, and I'm going to spend some time on this. Years ago when we, when we talked about B-cell lymphoma versus T-cell lymphoma, it was really just about prognosis. And it still is to some degree, but, but that, has, that certainly has changed a lot. So B-cell and T-cell, I might have had a conversation five years ago with a client that went something like, well, we could determine which type of lymphoma you had because prognostically as we move down the road, your prognosis would change. Maybe you have 12 to 14 month median survival time if you have B-cell lymphoma. Maybe you have more like a 6 to 10 month survival time or less if you have a T-cell lymphoma. Basically saying T-cells tougher to treat, it's more resistant to the drugs we have, the loss of remission is, is usually more rapid. 
And that still holds true, but there are some big, big significant changes now as we move forward with treatment. There are certainly drugs that have been found over the last few years to be much more effective against T-cell lymphoma. So if I know what you have, I may pick different drugs for you for your treatment than I would if you had B-cell lymphoma. Meaning there are some studies I'm going to talk about in a minute that really show that with different drug selection, you may have a different survival time. Years ago, we didn't know that. We would just treat them all with a multi-drug CHOP protocol and these guys got six months and these guys got 12 months and we thought that's all we could do. But knowing which one you have can change the drugs we use. There's also some new technology out there and new advances that we're going to talk a lot about that are offered only to B cells. And if we know you have B cell lymphoma, now we have, and this is kind of a little bit of a spoiler, something called a lymphoma vaccine that I'm going to be talking about tonight that is really exciting and it is exclusively for B cell. So I need to know you have that before I can give it to you. So this has become more and more important and that's, that's something that I really start to encourage people to consider doing when they find out that you have lymphoma is let's figure out which type you have. To do that is where these tests come into play. Because there's about four different ways you can find out if you have B-cell lymphoma versus T-cell lymphoma. The oldest way, most tried and true way, is you take a biopsy of your lymph node, you send it to the lab, and they will expose it to a couple special stains, some immunohistochemistry, CD3 if you're T-cell, CD79A if you're B-cell, and whatever color it changes, whether it's pink or purple, they'll tell you which one you have. It's still a great option. I'm, I'm definitely telling you it's still a great option, but there are some negatives to it and some positives to it. The positives to it is it works. I mean, it's very effective. The negative to it is that you have to do uh, a biopsy. Um, and we're going to go into that in a lot more detail. You can actually do immunocytochemistry now. This is probably the least effective of the four in terms of just reliability and, and, and sensitivity and specificity, but it is very easy to do. And that's where after you take your cytology of the lymph node, you make about five or six more slides, you put them in a box and put as much dang tape on it as you can that says do not stain these slides because you don't want them to text to grab it when they get to the lab and stain them all with H&E because then those, line, those slides are done. But you can do immunocytochemistry. You can stain those slides with special stains and determine just like you did with those biopsies. And then there's two new techniques, and these are going to be my favorite. Flow cytometry and PCR uh, for antigen receptor rearrangement, or PAR. Now, we start with just your tried and true biopsy. I mean, your biopsy for me, and, and I've done this a lot over the years and like it, is you get a, a sample of tissue and more than just cells, a good nice chunk of tissue that the lab can work on. You can do a complete node removal, no question about it. Uh, sometimes that's very straightforward to do. I mean, years ago, I, definitely I remember going through my residency and they taught us to take the back, lay them on the back, take the back leg, pull it forward, and you take that popliteal lymph node out. You just pull it back over and make an incision. It pops right out like you're neutering the dog, basically, and then put a couple stitches in. You can actually do just as, just as well off a little needle core biopsy, and that's super easy. You give them a little uh, dexmedetomidine, make just a small poke in there with your true cut, take a couple samples out, wake the dog up. You don't have to do any suturing or any major surgical excision, and you send it to the lab. Now, CD3 is typically the chosen stain for a T-cell. Depending on which lab you use, they use every, these, these last three, 79, 20, and 21, which are stains that are used for B-cell lymphoma. If you have any questions on which stain to use, then you just call the lab and go, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, T-cell versus B-cell. What do you all recommend? And they usually have a, a pretty distinct panel. The negatives for this, again, it works. True cut's pretty easy to do. But the negative is you have to pay for each one of those stains. And it can be pretty costly depending on where you send it. Dog is also going through a little bit of a surgical procedure to have it done. Um, not that any of these are real technically demanding, but, but those are two negative things about it. If we look at immunocytochemistry, same principle, you're just making slides, you've got to make multiple slides. Some labs certainly will tell you they, they're not big fans of it because again you have to stain each slide and see if they stick. There are some T cells that don't take up CD3 and there are some T cells that don't take up CD4. Um, same thing with B cells, so you just pick one, you stain your slides. Now the negative is, is if you, they picked wrong and they stained them and they didn't, nothing stuck to them or they had a weird staining pattern. They say, send me some more slides. Those didn't work. If you started treating the dog and all the lymph node trunk down, you don't have anything to sample anymore. So that's one of the negatives and reason I don't do this a lot is because I think that's 
it, with a biopsy, they can at least make new sections if you send them a nice chunk to keep working through. With this, they really got to be smart because they only got really one shot at it. This is what we do here. This is going to be what we do to determine B and T cell. We use a technique called flow cytometry. And this is certainly something that's very easy to do. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of veterinarians I'm working with now that, that have called me and asked me how to do it. And they go, oh, that was easy, way easier than I thought it would be. So this is actually where we collect live cells from the, uh, from the lymph node. We'll actually put them in just, and, and when I say live cells, there's not really, that sounds way more demanding than it is. I mean, I take an aspirate of the lymph node and I squirt it into a red top tube with a little saline in it. Um, and, and it's, like I said, I can walk you through it. It's very easy. But we stain, we basically collect some live cells. When we collect those live cells and send them to the lab, those cells are labeled with antibodies. On cell surfaces, there are proteins or antigens on the surface. And antibodies will just stick to their particular receptor. Every cell, whether it's a B cell or a T cell or a null cell or whatever lymphocyte, has different receptors on their cell surface. These coordinating uh, antibodies will stick to those receptors. Then you put your sample through a flow cytometer, which is a machine that quantifies and determines which antibodies stuck to those cell surfaces and how many cells had each one of those antibodies stuck to it. The Diagnosis of cancer can be made off of it because if you have a very homogeneous population, they're all identical, they all have the same antibodies sticking to the same uh, antigens, then that's consistent with neoplasia. Again, if they send a ton of different branches from the military after a reactive lymph node, that's more of a reactive process. Now what's cool about flow cytometry is it is not just diagnosing you having lymphoma. It's not just diagnosing if you're a T cell or B cell. It looks for patterns because it doesn't just throw CD3 at it and go, let's see if it turns purple. It puts CD3, CD4, CD8, CD20, CD2. I mean, they give a whole plethora and it's all the same cost. They just throw all the antibodies in and see what sticks to what. Now it will come out and say, hey, you were 100% positive for CD3, we know you're a T cell, but not all T cells are the same. What we found in dogs now is that certain T cells are more aggressive than others. There's indolent forms of the disease where I'll find that dog with T cell that lives for three years. And there are B cells that do really bad and we go, well, what the hell happened? That guy was a B cell lymphoma and he lived for four months. So what they're looking for, just like in people, is in humans, we see that there's hundreds of different types of lymphoma out there and they look for patterns and what we're trying to do with these patterns is determine is all dogs with T-cell and all dogs with B-cell lymphoma equivocal or are there certain patterns that we pick up on and go, we've seen this pattern before. When you have all three of those positive, you actually do really, really well or you do really, really bad. And the, the, the lab that I send my cells to, and, and I'm a University of Missouri grad, but I send my stuff to University of Colorado, Colorado State University that is, because Colorado State University has a cancer, um, they have a cancer lab there that particularly works in the immunology field and they are the one that are banking all of these samples and looking for those patterns. And so when we send our stuff in, they put a write up at the end and says, dogs that have the same stating pattern as you and our lab have a, have a survival time of this many days or have reported to have this type of response to treatment. That's going to get better and better the more of those samples we get. But the cool thing is, is this costs the same as if you just sent a slide in for cytology. I mean, it actually is, is pretty inexpensive. And you don't have to pick, give me this one and give me this one to see which I, one I have. You, they, they will expose it to all different types and, and look for those staining patterns. The negative with it is the cells have to be alive. And so when we look at the cell samples, if you take it on Friday, it's not going to be probably good by Monday. So you have to have a cell, like if I collected it today, I put it on ice overnight at the Colorado State, they open it tomorrow and they run the sample. There's no question that's a, that's a limiting factor by it. If you have cells that are not alive, then you can do this, and it's, it's better but not as good as, as flow. It's better than immunocytochemistry. This is where instead of looking for those, those cells where they have those live antigens that the antibodies will attach to, because when the cells die, those just go, mm, and they don't stick anymore very well. So 
this is where we're taking the cells and we're amplifying DNA. And the DNA will amplify, gets quantified through PCR, and they'll say, hey, this is the known stating pattern for T cell. This is the known stating pattern for B cell. Uh, it's good. Um, there's benefits to it and negatives to it. Like I said, the benefit to it is, is that you don't have to have a live cell. You can collect that one on Friday and it'll sit there and they're fine to do it off of that. Don't take my word for it. As we go through this stuff tonight, lymphoma is one of those cool talks that there's a ton of research in it. And so I wanted to include some uh, different studies that have been done over the years. Some of these are, are pretty new. Some of these are just historic studies that, have had, that are hallmarks in our field. I don't like a real wordy slide, but I put all this stuff in here so you can refer back to it later on and go, oh yeah, he put that in there. I can read through that, that abstract real quick. Big thing you want to know on this slide, I highlight in yellow on these slides what's really, really important, is this is looking at immunophenotyping versus immunohistochemistry, so biopsy that lymph node, flow cytometry, and then the PCR. And what they found in 62 dogs was the sensitivity of flow cytometry was significantly higher than PAR, and that was higher than your biopsy. Basically, the conclusion on it was, was that flow cytometry is superior to PAR at correct, correctly predicting immunophenotype. Again, I think the big thing that I like about it is it looks for those patterns, and hopefully that's going to result in some cool stuff down the road for us in terms of determining these, these different forms of the diseases that exist. And it says in this, if fresh samples are not available for flow cytometry, PAR is an acceptable assay. They really liked in that study flow and PAR, and I think it just is a, is a new kind of direction we're probably going to start going. Those are really, really benign things. No sedation, no anesthesia, no surgery, no biopsies, and really effective and cost is, is, is cheaper or equivocal for the, for the owner. So it's just learning new techniques, and, uh, and you will see these things start to come to light more and more. One more thing on it I would say is... is um, you have that, we go back to that diagnosis, you got the dog with the big lymph node and you're trying to figure out if it's cancer or not and you take an aspirate and you send it to a pathologist and he looks at it and he waffles and goes, I don't know, maybe it's emerging lymphoma, maybe it's not. Flow cytometry takes that human error out of it as well. I mean, it runs it through a machine and if the cells are all the same, the cells are all the same. I don't need some guy to tell me the cells are the same. They're all the same if they stay in the same pattern and they come back and go, this is, this is a tumor. So those cases that you have where you're scratching your head and go, I biopsied it, I've aspirated it, they can't tell me what it is. That flow, you can sample those weird lymph nodes and send them in and they can run those, they can run it to that machine and that staining pattern, if they're homogenous, that is diagnostic for a tumor. So that's another benefit to doing that. It takes that human error out of it. Um, flow and, and you know the big things again must be overnighted, must be fresh samples, but it gives you a lot of that phenotypic information about those patterns. PAR, you can use it off really rare cells. The cells don't have to be alive, and you can actually even do it off slides. You can send slides out there that aren't stained yet, or actually they, they told me that you could, they can actually do it off stained cells. They'll wash it. Cells fall into the solution, they amplify the DNA of those cells and can actually run BNT off of slides that you already have that may have been sitting in your office for a week. PAR's got some, some interesting stuff. If you have any questions when you call those labs, they'll walk you through that stuff as well. Treatment course for lymphoma. Obviously, chemotherapy is considered the gold standard in our field because it is a non-Hodgkin systemic disease. It's not localized to one area, so we need to treat the whole dog. We don't need to treat one lymph node. So there's first line and second line therapies. First line therapies are going to be what's considered the most effective. One of the common trends you'll see with lymphoma in dogs and in people is that multi-drug protocols have always won out versus solitary single agent protocols. Multi-drug protocols are good because honestly you're just not putting all your eggs in one basket. You're, you're diversifying your treatment course and you're picking drugs from different classes that work in different ways. So cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone all come from different classes. They're different forms of chemotherapy with different targets. So if one doesn't work, you hope that these other three are going to pick up the slack. So if you ever wonder where CHOP come from, because how does C, D, V, and P spell CHOP? It comes from cyclophosphamide, and then the original doxorubicin, when you, when you looked at the old stuff, was actually called hydroxydanorubicin. And then vincristine's name was Oncovin and prednisone. So that's where they come up with it. But uh, just, again, fun fact. But it is considered the primary gold standard for chemotherapy for dogs with lymphoma. It is a first-line therapy. 
It is by far and away including the drugs that we feel are the most effective, have the highest response rates, and the highest effective treatment course for dogs with lymphoma. Certainly, when we look at it, first treatment is going to include vincristine. Some of us will combine l asparginase with it. Um, people ask me about this all the time. <clears throat> I used to do it all the time. I don't do it very commonly now. I actually will hold my l spar because there were two or three papers that came out about five, six years ago that showed that dogs that had l spar at their first treatment um, versus dogs that didn't have l spar at their first treatment, if they were all in remission by the time they hit their fourth treatment, they had no difference in survival time. Really, if you get in remission, you get in remission. It doesn't matter if it was just Vink or Vink and Elspar. The nice thing about it is Elspar, usually your body will generate a resistance to it after one or two treatments. So if you can hold this, when this dog comes out of remission 10 months later or 12 months later, then you can use that to get him back in remission. It's just one more tool in your arsenal. Or if you've got that dog that's neutropenic down the road and can't get a treatment or something's off, he's not doing well, but he's neutropenic, Elspar does not affect your white blood cell count significantly, and you can actually use it in the face of those low white blood cell counts. So if I don't need it, I'll hold on to it. But if the dog is sick, he's hypercalcemic, he's not doing well, I'll pull it out because you want to use it when you have to, and that may be at the first treatment when you have to. Another first-line therapy that we don't talk a lot about is a, is a course called uh, COAP. And so COAP or COAP is cyclophosphamide, vincristine, cytosine arabinicide or cytosar, and prednisone. Now what you see that's missing from this protocol is doxorubicin. Uh, it's not in the course. Uh, years ago we used it in cases where you had a cardiac condition or, which we'll talk more about, if you had CNS involvement. This drug right here is, is heavily penetrates into the central nervous system. It's considered an excellent first-line therapy for B and T-cell lymphoma. It has a comparable response rate and, and in some studies a, a similar median survival time. Again, you can use Elspar with it just like you would the, uh, the CHOP protocol. This is a study that, that compared the two of these. It's a little older, it's 2007. I'm going to hit on some things I don't like about this study. But it, when it first came out, people were like, oh, well, they're, they're similar. I'll just stop using Dr. Rubison. That Don't do that. This, this study actually goes through all this, and then the last thing they say in their conclusion is the use of a long-term doxorubicin containing combination chemotherapy protocol is associated with a decreased risk of relapse and death. They just basically thought that the, the guys had a longer survival time. What they didn't do in this protocol is they did not break out who had T-cell, who had B-cell. I mean, if all the, neg all the T-cells were in the CHOP side of things, then that's going to definitely skew your results. But what they saw was a pretty big range. I mean, we had some dogs going 356 on this one and some over here 438, but it was 174, 94. I thought those numbers were low. I mean, they're low for what I see, but, but it is a good protocol. And I think one of the things I bring up about it is, is it is a, a less expensive protocol. I mean, if we have an option or we have a dog that just can't have doxorubicin or uh, a situation where maybe it's not financially feasible to do multiple doses of doxorubicin, this is a decent one here as a first-line therapy. MOP, M-O-P-P, another combination protocol is used as both a first-line and second-line therapy. It contains a drug mustergen vincristine, procarbazine, and prednisone. So this, is a, this certainly is a protocol that has been around for a long time. Now MOP is the most commonly used as a second line therapy. It's a great rescue course and it has a lot of good factors about it as a rescue course. It highlights some drugs that have been similarly used in the first course, but it also includes new drugs that were not tapped into that have a very high efficacy, mustergen and procarbazine, a very high efficacy against lymphoma. The big thing about MOP is it now has seen some, some response and kind of some resurgence as a protocol as T-cell lymphoma patients are being identified and, and we are looking at MOP as one of those courses that includes two drugs, mustergen and procarbazine, that have just been shown to be more effective against T-cell variations of the disease. So a study was used as MOP as a first-line therapy for T-cell dogs, and what they found in this study was really, really neat. What we found was that dogs that actually got treated with MOP did significantly better than historic data on dogs with T-cell treated with our original um, CHOP protocol. So this study had 50 dogs in it with T-cell lymphoma or 50 dogs with hypercalcemic lymphoma that we assume to be T-cell. The overall response rate was about 98% which we do see about 90-95% with our CHOP, so that, that was similar. The median survival time on these guys in the study was 189 days with 25 disease 
25% of these guys still doing well long term at like 930 days, which is which is pretty unusual for dogs with T-cell lymphoma. The overall survival time that they, they tallied out on these dogs is about 270 days. Again, that was really equivocal to some of the things we've seen with CHOP for B-cell. So everybody got really excited and go, wow, that's a big study, 50 dogs. They all had T-cell for the most part. And these guys had a really, really extended survival time. I definitely started using mustard when this came out and, and kind of did a lot more with it and, and used that and I still kind of talk about it more. You know, the one of the reasons I abandoned it, and, and, and it's not that I've completely abandoned it, I, I want to use it more, but is this right here. When we looked at these dogs, about 20% of dogs required hospitalization in this study. That's a lot. That's a lot of dogs. That's a lot of unhappy owners. 20% of dogs that were treated had pretty significant adverse events. They're pushing them hard in the study. I mean, this to get to that number, it's not that that's not acceptable. And if I have a dog with T-cell lymphoma, I'll bring it up to clients and go, look, there's some studies that says that this, is, this protocol could result in a lot more extended survival time, but you're running the risk here, a higher risk of side effects. When I look at dogs that we hospitalize, I would say the number of dogs I hospitalize with lymphoma on a yearly basis is actually significantly low, like less than 5% probably like 2%, 3% at the most, if that. And, and we, we kind of joked about it here a while back and then had one that we had to hospitalize that got neutropenic. She did great and went on and did wonderful. But it was, I said, man, we haven't had to hospitalize anybody in forever. And then like the next one we treated, we had to hospitalize. But it was, uh, it was just one of those things that it is rare is where I'm going with it. 20% is not that rare. So, you know, you, the, the, I think it's a more aggressive protocol. But I do think that it does highlight that there are some drugs that work better against T-cell lymphoma and there is some potential for dogs to still do significantly well if they, if they have a T-cell variation. If we look at second line therapies, there's a lot of rescue courses out there. One that I really like, a lot of people use, is Lomustine. So Lomustine or CCNU, second line therapy, very good course for being T-cell lymphoma patients. You will see some improved survival time in T-cell variations. This is another drug that really is a, a good choice for T-cell forms of the disease. Cutaneous lymphoma, which we'll talk about later, Lomustine has been shown a few times to be a, a real, real good option for those guys. It's not considered a great first line therapy, and I'll show you some statistics on that in just a second, but I will say that I do like it as rescue and this is usually the thing that I go to in a lot of patients as my second line therapy. So it has been attempted as a first line therapy, 17 dogs, about 60 to 70 mg per meter squared, once every three days, five doses, typically how most people give it. The survival time is about 111 days, so it's pretty low. I mean, it's not, it just didn't hold them very long. I mean, some of these guys were out of remission within, two, within a month or two. Um, I, you know, the findings just did not support it to be a first line treatment. If we look at it as a second line treatment though, for refractory lymphoma, we got almost the exact same numbers. So 87% response rate in these guys, these were 31 dogs after CHOP that were treated with just uh, Lomustine and, and maybe some PRED, maybe a dose of LSPAR. Again, 111 days uh, of dogs achieving a complete response, which is very common because 87% of them did. So again, you're, you're getting in that three month window. Let's say a dog goes into remission, he gets a year with CHOP, you, you, know, you, put, him on, you put him on this protocol and you can squeeze another three and a half months out of that. That's not bad. I mean, that's not bad and then you can go to something else. So, so I'd like it to get three or four months after we relapse. And so it is a good rescue option, but that's pretty short for an initial uh, treatment course. DMAC is a, a protocol that really takes your CHOP and just picks out different drugs. So instead of PRED, we use dexamethasone. Instead of cytoxin, we use the alkylating agent melflin. Instead of doxorubicin, we use the anthracycline uh, actinomycin D. And then we use cytosine and rabinocide. So you're just building a protocol using the next drugs on that, that list of response and, and um, optimal effects. It's a good second line course. Um, I don't think it's a great first line because it does have increased potential drug related adverse events like MOP. These protocols are just, you're having, to, you're having to push them harder when you get into this because your population of cells have been exposed to drugs. They're gonna be more resistant. Dexamethasone, this DMAC protocol, 54 dogs, 72% of dog responded, so not a bad response. Median duration was only a couple months though. So I don't like it as well as Lomustine. Like I said, with Lomustine alone, pretty reduced side effects, easy to give once every three weeks. This is a pretty intense protocol, pretty inexpensive. We picked up 111 days. DMAC, uh, we only got two months. So 
And these are pretty good studies. They both had at least 50 dogs in them. So it, this can be a third line. We use it every now and then, but uh, I think it's a, a rescue protocol. But I mean, I, I like I like my little mustine as a second line and, and mustardin and the mop protocol for for maybe T cells. What do you want to know? General prognosis. Well, like I said, it's it's not can we get you in remission. These remission rates are, are usually 90% or more. I mean, this 60 to 90% just kind of depending on what you're doing. I mean, we're getting, we're getting up there. We're getting that 90% response rate. Most dogs will go in remission. A lot of these guys, depending on what we're using, we're getting out there over 12 months. We're seeing about 20, 25% of the cases that are treated with CHOP going two years. And then when we start to look at our rescue protocols, they're all over the place. But, I mean, you're going anywhere from a month and a half out to three or four months with those rescue courses. I think the take-home that I look at with treating multicentric lymphoma with chemo is again I expect you to go in remission I expect you to tolerate it well it's all about now keeping you there a couple different things have been looked at to try to keep dogs in remission one is radiation therapy it's got a limited application it can be used in a couple different manners maybe you have a single lymph node that's really really problematic or you have a mediastinal mass I think that's where you're going to see it most commonly used whole body radiation has been done half body radiation has been done the idea is, is that I've got you in remission can I get those cells that are resistant to drug lymphocytes are responsive to radiation and, and it's certainly something that has been looked at Dogs that went through this treatment, realistically when we looked at it, the survival times are real similar to that of chemotherapy alone. We didn't pick up a lot of time. It has certainly some efficacy with these solitary Hodgkins-like diseases or extranodal where you can just go in and just zap that one mass and just really flatten it down and get it under control. If I look at it and talk you know, kind of about where it's at right now, I mean, I just don't think it's found its way into readily usable situation for your systemic multicentric lymphoma. And it's really, in my opinion, used more commonly for these solitary masses right now. The big one here, and the last thing we'll talk about with the multicentric guys, is immunotherapy. Immunotherapy has been around for a long time. Most common use for it in our field right now is the melanoma vaccine, treating melanomas. Uh, you guys have probably either talked to me about it or read some things about it. Well, Marielle this year released, after a lot of different work and a lot of time that we've put into it, a commercially licensed or commercially conditionally licensed uh, canine lymphoma vaccine. Now this is not a vaccine that prevents dogs from getting lymphoma. This is not a vaccine that you give to dogs when they have big giant lymph nodes to try to make all that go away. It is designed to meet that problem that we have with lymphoma and that's keeping you in remission. It is commercially available. We do have it. I can use it. We've used it in a dog here already. It only became available here um, at kind of the start of the summer. It's used basically for immunization of dogs with large B-cell lymphoma. So again, this is very specific. You have to know the dog has B-cell lymphoma. And to find that out, you really have to know that before you start treating them with chemo because if you start treating them, we expect you to go into remission. These are dogs that go through treatment with CHOP-based chemotherapy protocol, get in remission, they're holding the remission, they're doing well, and then after you come off of chemo, we give you these four transdermal injection series. So here's the little applicator you guys are familiar with. We do one vaccine every two weeks, and the good news is, is just like with the, the melanoma vaccine, there are no side effects that have been reported, no significant issues, no side effects of vomiting, nausea, anything like that. So how's it work? Well, remember the goal of it is to keep you in remission. The challenge with cancer, though, is that the host cannot recognize that that's cancer. These are cells that are supposed to be in your body. These are lymphocytes, but they've got a defect now where genetically they're able to reproduce on their own. So now they're increasing in number, but they still are not foreign enough for the body to go, you're not supposed to be here. So they flourish and they increase and you have this, this plethora of cancer cells that start to accumulate, whether it's a solitary mass or in this case lymphoma that's, that's systemic. The immune system cannot fight it off, and so again, it can just it cannot defend against those cells. CD20 is one of those common things we were stating for on cells. It's a common antigen that's expressed on B cells. We use it as our markers to determine if you have have B cell lymphoma. The canine lymphoma vaccine is produced using a plasmid DNA with a gene se sequence from a mouse CD20. So these are mouse B cells. It's called a xenogenic immunotherapy. So the DNA from the mouse is put into the dog, it's injected into the dog, and it's taken up by their host cells. Now, the murine CD20 becomes transcribed into the host cells and it's presented to the immune system. 
The immune system recognizes that that's a mouse CD20. That's not supposed to be here. So it starts generating all of these, basically all of these antibodies against that CD20. When those antibodies are produced, the immune system recognizes that they're abnormal, but the antibodies actually do not recognize the difference between a mouse CD20 and a dog CD20 on a malignant lymphocyte. So although the immune system says that's not supposed to be here and it makes all these antibodies, the antibodies aren't quite as smart as that immunocell that, that noticed it. So they go after every CD20. So they start killing off CD20 on the canine lymphocyte as well as particularly the malignant ones and that murine few that were in the body. So you generate this big immune response against it. So that leads to destruction of the neoplastic B cells that have that CD20 on them. The vaccine to date, basically at this point where we are, is, and kind of what do we know about it? Well, we've used this same xenogenic technology successfully in the melanoma vaccine onset, and it showed significant survival improvement in dogs with melanomas. It has had similar success in the human side, so these vaccines have existed in the human side for a little bit longer than, than we've been using them, and they've been affected for the same non-Hodgkin form of lymphoma that's out there that we're treating in dogs. So we jumped on that, or Marielle jumped on that and said, well, let's make one for dogs and see if it does the same thing. The pilot studies that have been done in these dogs, the survival time has been significantly extended in, in dogs that have received chemotherapy and then went on to get this vaccine. And these are dogs that went through your typical CHOP-based Wisconsin Madison protocol and we compared them to dogs that got the, the chemotherapy and uh, the vaccine versus dogs that just got vaccine or excuse me, chemotherapy alone. What we saw was is that dogs that went through that CHOP-based protocol and got the vaccine, these guys stayed in remission for greater than 730 days and a lot of them didn't even reach their survival time in this initial study way better than what we saw over here with the CHOP alone. Remember, CHOP alone, we only saw about 25% of dogs get to 730. That 730 is that target of two years, and what they're looking for is how many dogs can get there. Well, almost all the dogs in that vaccine study protocol got to two years. We're only about 20-25% in the CHOP was. I mean, this is really, really, really big. I mean, we have been stuck at one-year survival times for dogs' lymphoma forever. But don't get excited too quick because What's the limitations? The main limitation on this information right now is it's low power. I mean, it just came out. They're only pilot studies. They pushed this thing to the market as quick as possible. And really they did that with not a ton of like these big, big studies. So the problem is, is that I have seen stuff like this happen before, even in, in my short time as an oncologist, where it looks really, really good with 10 dogs and then you put it in 100 dogs and it doesn't look as good. So what we have to do is kind of wait I will tell you it's the, it's the most exciting thing that we've had in our field for a while now and I'm really, I'm really anxious to see as I treat more dogs and, and more dogs are treated across the country with this that is that, you know, does that, uh, I guess you'd say, does that 730 two year survival time become the new norm in dogs that get both. Other limitations is this is only B cell. They do not have a T cell variation of it yet but the same technology could be utilized. Patients must be in remission, so you have to go through chemo, you have to have microscopic disease. The vaccine is good, but your immune system is not going to attack a trillion lymphocytes in your lymph nodes. It's going to attack, or attack those, those residual cells that were resistant to chemo that are just in microscopic levels. And it takes about four to six weeks to generate that response. So you cannot be coming out of remission and hit them with a vaccine because it takes about a month and a half before you can generate those antibodies to go after it. But it's exciting. And we do have it, and if we do have clients that are looking for it, then certainly I'm, I'm ready to treat more and more dogs with, the, uh, with this vaccine. Is there a cost? Say that again, the cost? Cost Oh, yeah. I think, that, I think that is a big downfall to it right now. So it is equivocal to the melanoma vaccine. So the vaccine is about 2500 bucks. The question is, is, is that going to be the norm? No, it's not going to be the norm because they've got a patent on it right now for a couple years. And the reason they set that number at that high, I'll be honest with you, is because this is the first time in our, in our career, in our history of veterinary medicine, that we have went after FDA licensed chemotherapy treatments or immunotherapy treatments for dogs. And so their, their research and development is substantial. I've heard with the melanoma vaccine for them to recoup what it costs to create that, that it would take somewhere like a decade.
of selling it. Now the melanoma vaccine has already been around that long so we expect in the next couple of years that to drop down significantly but most of the time the melanoma vaccine if you look across the country is about 2200 to about 2700. The difference between melanoma and the lymphoma vaccine is the melanoma vaccine does replace chemotherapy. So if you go in and remove an oral melanoma in a dog and you treat them with the vaccine they don't go through chemo and then the vaccine. They just get the vaccine. Do I think it's worth it? That's the question. If I have a client that says we're a one-shot deal, you know, we're going to do chop and we're going to get our year. If it comes out of remission, we're going to let nature take its course and just keep her comfortable. That's totally, that's totally fine. I think those, you know, that population of clients are going to be there. But then you're going to have that population that say, you know what, I want to, I want to do whatever I can to get as much time as I can and keep them in remission. That's the ones I think this will work for. And uh, and then as it gets reduced in cost, you know, maybe we can get it in other clients. But again, like I said, if you compare what you do spend on those rescue protocols, if those numbers hold true, then then I think the twenty five hundred dollars is probably a good commit, or a good investment for them. These next few topics here, again, we'll try to get you out of here on time. We got about a half hour. Um, definitely, the biggest part that I wanted to focus on was the was the multicentric nodal lymphoma because that that's our more common. We do have a three or four different variations of it. These are roughly just going to be referred to as extra nodal manifestations of the disease. So the first one that I wanted to highlight is cutaneous lymphoma or epitheliotropic lymphoma. So in humans this can, and in dogs, this can uh, occur in two different variations. You can have a localized variation of it or a disseminated variation. The, the localized, you'll hear the term mycosis fungoides, and that's because initially people thought that it was actually a fungus on the skin. Uh, disseminated variation is called Cesare syndrome as an individual's name. Cesare syndrome is actually where your cutaneous lymphoma becomes so systemic, so disseminated, on your skin, it actually starts to develop a leukemic profile. And when I draw your blood, you have this incredibly high uh, white blood cell count that are all lymphocytes. This is bad stuff right here. But we don't see it a lot, thank goodness. We see quite a bit of the more localized and multifocal skin variations of it. When you see it, it is super hard to diagnose by just looking at. So it has, it can look like pyderma and pemphigus. It certainly can look like just, just, a, just a dermatitis, superficial dermatitis. It can be nodules, it can be crusts, it can be plaques. I'll show you a couple, uh, a couple examples in a minute. And it also doesn't have to be just the skin. I've seen these in the mouth. Um, I've seen perineal, uh, ocular involvement. The ocular ones are strange. You'll, you'll basically, on the cornea, you'll actually have like a mass developing on the cornea. So these are, these are rare manifestations. Most of them are going to be skin. You're going to think that it's pyoderma or pemphigus or some, some dermatologic issue. Um, Dr. O'Neill, our dermatologist, will see these. I will see these if she sees them and diagnoses them, then usually um, we'll work together and treat them or send them over, but a lot of them will go through derm first because of that. The, the diagnosis is usually going to be made when we take biopsies or do those scrapes or cytology of the, of the derm lesions, just like you normally would. Many of them will be T-cell in origin. There are B-cell variations of skin lymphoma, but the majority are going to be T-cell. And like I said, it, it can present localized as one nodule. You take it off, you find out, and then later on you start developing in other places. That is my experience. My experience with it is, is the dog might just have this. And then we biopsy and go, well, it's just got that one lesion, and then it starts showing up here, 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 multiple spots in the body. If you have a solitary localized lesion, you, it's certainly not wrong to go ahead and do a complete excision and take it off. Uh, in humans and in dogs, we'll do radiation to a, a solitary mass or solitary nodule. But I'd always talk to folks about the potential for these to become more systemic and, and certainly develop more of these nodules with time. The treatment of it is really going to be based on the fact that we do see a lot of them go systemic and go to multiple uh, multifocal spots. If we biopsy it and we determine that this is a T-cell variant, which is common. The drug of choice for, uh, for this disease is lomustine. Lomustine is, is one of those, again, I mentioned earlier, that does have an increased, uh, an increased efficacy against T-cell lymphoma. The prognosis is kind of crazy. Uh, if you see that number, quoting it to somebody, they'd be like, well, that has absolutely no help whatsoever because you just told me three months or four years. But the, the reality of it is, is, is you can have that wide a variation. You can have these dogs that you, you remove that nodule, you treat them with some lomustine, maybe you do four or five doses, and then they do great for three or four years, and then it relapses and you start to get them in multiple locations. The norm for me, because really you hear that and you see that in papers, what do I see? The norm for me is not that. The norm for me is dogs start to develop multiple lesions pretty early on 
one. We start treating them with lamustine and steroids and they have a great response. Everything kind of reduces down. Those lesions start to heal. The dogs look better. We're down the road about 10 months, 12 months, and they relapse. My experience with uh, cutaneous lymphoma is about 18 months. I think it is similar to, you know, when we look at the B cell guys, this study that they use, they diagnose B cell. Because B cell um, has had that historic better response to CHOP, I usually do treat those with more of your standard multi-drug protocol. And the median survival time in studies is around the same as what we see with nodal around that year, maybe a little bit better. For T cell, I usually tell clients the similar. I, I tell them about that 14 to 18 months. Um, you may be relapsing and having more nodules around the year, but that's what I expect. The long-term survivals are going to be the more isolated ones that just stay in one spot. But when I see cutaneous lymphoma, the, the take-home, what do you want to know about this is that one, if it's a T cell variation, this is the drug I like to reach for. If it's a B cell, I like to do my standard protocol. And I think the thing that you want to tell clients is that going multifocal or systemic is really common. We just see a lot of these show up in, in other locations in the skin. GI lymphoma or alimentary lymphoma is rare and I'm glad it is because it's typically a fairly aggressive disease. It only accounts for about 5% of all the lymphoma cases we see. Your clinical signs are truly going to be GI related, so nausea, vomiting, weight loss, diarrhea, your typical anorexia patients. So diagnosis is typically made. We can do an ultrasound to say why is this guy not eating? Why is he not doing well? We go in, we do an ultrasound and we see typically a marked thickening of the digestive tract. Very similar to what we see in cats with intestinal lymphoma in terms of what it looks like on an ultrasound. So just obviously in a bigger bigger scale, uh, you're going to have that loss of layering of the wall, the small intestine, the wall's too thick for just being inflammation. You can't make out your mucosa, submucosa muscles, serosal layers, and you may start to see some associated lymph node enlargement around it. You look at that and go, wow, that's, that's like diffuse thickening of the intestinal tract, and there's that loss of layering and lymph node that I've heard about and seen in cats with lymphoma. The difference is, is that dogs with GI lymphoma is more aggressive. It is certainly more aggressive than cats and it's certainly more, and it's certainly more aggressive than what we see uh, with dogs with big lymph nodes, liver and spleen, your multicentric nodal lymphoma. GI lymphoma is a pretty tough disease. It is typically T cell in origin. Um, it usually hits dogs pretty hard, pretty fast, and you see several clinical signs related to it. There's no real standard protocol for treating it because it is a fairly rare disease, so there's nobody that jumps out and says, this is how you're supposed to do this. But I will say that most of the time we use a multi-drug protocol. We have seen, with, like with a lot of pet cases, that multi-agent therapies are, are going to be better and have more favorable results. With the T-cell variations, which is what we see with a lot of them, we do try to add these alkylating agents like lomustine, um, the MOP protocols in early on. But I will tell you historically, dogs with GI lymphoma do fairly poor. The clinical signs are pretty significant. Owners, unfortunately, um, just really struggle with what they see because they see that diarrhea, you see that vomiting, you see that weight loss. They kind of wax and wane, so some dogs will really improve, but then they relapse fairly early. You know, when you compare this to cats, you'll have those cats with GI lymphoma that higher grades at six to ten months down the road are having issues. Low grade lymphomas, they'll be out two years from now on Lucaran and prednisone only and doing really well. These guys, these are fairly short survival times, and, and a lot of it is it's just poor quality of life. I mean, when we start to treat patients, one of the things I tell every one of my clients is that, you know, we are treating initially here to get you good quality life. I mean, we're going for quality over quantity, and if you've got good quality and you're feeling well and you're doing well, the quantity goes along with that. It, you, you know, we'll keep that. But in dogs with GI lymphoma, quality sometimes can be an issue and, and result in an early stop. You can handle a big lymph node running around, but if you've got that same thickening in your GI tract, it's a different story. Studies looking at treatment for GI lymphoma. This was a study, it's an older one, but it's a good one. 2009, 18 dogs, histologically confirmed GI lymphoma. We knew that's what you had. Of this, most of the dogs had T cell origin, so about 63% of them were T cell variation. That was the overall median survival time. 
77 days. I mean, that was that was a tough deal. These were guys that got treated with a good combination shop-based protocol. But, but we were two or three months into it, and these guys were having issues. Now, as you can see, it's a big range. I mean, there are dogs out there that did really well for a long period of time. But the take-home on this study was it's, that, that survival in dogs with GL lymphoma treated with that multi-agent shop protocol is fairly poor. We don't see a large number of dogs get into a year, year and a half. But long-term survival is possible. That's exactly what I see. If you respond, and you know, somebody asked me, so is it worth treating GI lymphoma? Yeah, because I think if you respond, you respond in the first two or three weeks. And if you respond and, and really do well and get your quality of life back and are doing well, you have a potential to do that for, for several months, if not longer. But if you're one of those dogs that were two or three weeks in and you're just waxing and waning and you're still having diarrhea and you're still not really getting in remission, I have a lot of doubts that we'll ever get you there. Uh, the take home is again picking the right drugs and knowing when to go. All right, let's talk about this. This is where we are. We're three weeks in. We've tried three different drugs. You're still not where we want you to be. You know, I can keep moving forward. We can keep trying this, but I think your prognosis is going to be tapping out here in about two or three months. And, and I think that conversation, owners really appreciate it. Now, if I look at it and say, wow, we're really improving. We're doing well. We're back to normal. You're feeling good about it. I'm feeling good about it. Those are clients that are probably going to be on this higher end of the scale. So it's just a tough disease. It's an unpredictable one. It's one that I'm, I'm not a big fan of, but again, it's one we don't see a lot. Mediastinal lymphoma is one that we will run across. When you see a cranial mediastinal mass, you're thinking either lymphoma or a thymoma. <clears throat> Those are the two big ones. And they are very different. Lymphoma, obviously, if you diagnose lymphoma, you treat that medically with chemotherapy, and oftentimes you're going to get a big reduction, big response. Thymomas are different. Thymomas are going to be a, a disease that's oftentimes a surgical disease. You go in and hopefully be able to remove that. It's more of a locally aggressive disease, low metastatic rate, oftentimes develop in a slower nature. Um, I had a client ask me today about a thymoma and says, well, I, he said, my, uh, my brother's a veterinarian. He told me it's a benign disease. I said, well, depends on how you devi define benign versus malignant. The way I define benign is, is it ever going to cause me a problem? I mean, if you've got a big mass sitting on your trachea and your esophagus and pushing on the front of your heart, I worry it's going to cause you a problem at some point. So the, the thymoma, yes, slow growing, benign in the nature that it's slow growing and not going to metastasize. Malignant in the nature, it's not in a great location. So if you diagnose one of these and it's a young dog and a dog that we think has got a, a pretty good longevity, thymomas are good to go in and remove. But lymphoma is a medical disease. It's not one that we jump in and go in and try to remove from the chest. So the question on that is, how do, you, how do you differentiate between the two? So we're going to talk about that in just a second. But when these guys come in with any mediastinal mass, you can see some pretty unusual signs. So obviously you can have these changes like respiratory distress, you can have pleural effusion, um, you can get this polydipsy and polyuria again because some of those can induce hypercalcemia. You can see this, uh, this cervical edema or pitting edema in the head and neck. You can also see this, and I had never seen this until about uh, four months ago, and it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen a dog do. This Labrador came in, and he had lost a bunch of weight, had this big mediastinal mass, and the dog just sit there and went, hoo, hoo, hoo. and it looked just like a person with hiccups. It was so strange, but he was sitting there having hiccups. And, uh, and I'm like, is that dog hiccuping? And he's like, yep. And he's like, hoo, hoo. And it's because you have that big recurrent laryngeal nerve, vagus nerve, it runs right through there. Mass was sitting on it and it was causing inducing these spontaneous hiccups. But it was lymphoma. We started treating that dog and that dog's done awesome. He went through CHOP, he's off of chemo, he's running around. He's, it, it amazed me how well the dog did. Mass went down to nothing and after the first week it stopped hiccuping. But you can see that and, it, and it's been reported. I was just waiting to ever see one and, and when I saw it I'm like that is so cool. It's, and Not cool but cool. It's weird. But it was a uh um, the dog did great. He did really, really well. So mediastinal masses, you're going to see this mass sitting in front of the heart, wide into the cranium mediastinum. Sometimes it's, it's a very round, distinct mass. The lymphoma aspect of it, real quick, I mean, you'll see that, that hypercalcemia. It is also often T-cell in origin. Um, it can be part of a multicentric disease. Like I said, you can take radiographs for a dog with, with multifocal lymphoma or, or multicentric lymphoma and see that mediastinal mass. Or it can be just a solitary single mass all by itself. The thing you want to know about lymphoma and the mediastinum is how do I differentiate that from thymoma? Because that's going to be the big question. The first one is, this is a fairly new, uh, a new study that came out, it's 2014. Um, this is a study where we compared actually ultrasound images of dogs that had thymomas versus lymphoma. 
And I actually talked with this Dr. Wong about this today because I told her I was presenting this and said, have, have you read this because it's really cool. And it was looking at 50 animals that were diagnosed with either mediastinal thymoma or lymphoma. And they compared, went back and compared after they diagnosed them. I mean, these guys were confirmed which one they had. They said, well, what's the ultrasound look like? Can we tell from ultrasound which one you have? And there were some super, super common characteristic findings on it. There was nothing that was slam dunk, but we, when we look at these, there were some things that go, wow, that really, that really held true, and I've seen that multiple times as well. So th thymomas basically are oftentimes very cystic. They'll grow slowly, but they'll oftentimes outgrow some of their blood supply. So they get these little necrotic areas within them and get these cystic areas. And when you do an ultrasound, you'll see this, this super heterogeneous population. So thymomas, about 94% were heterogeneous, whereas your lymphoma, about 80% were real solid. I mean, they look like this, this kind of dense, solid lymph node. And so the, the heterogeneous thing is something we look for. Those little cystic areas are something we look for. It's something where I can go, I'm leaning thymoma on this dog. It also, you're looking at, does it fit? You know, has this, is this something that has developed quickly? Is this something that's, that we're seeing other lymph nodes enlarge, like if it's part of a secondary issue? But that was one of those things that when we looked at it, it they say that the basic finding was heterogeneous echinogenicity, internal cysts may certainly more, be more suggestive of a thymoma. Now, I totally post this. This is actually not a, a medial spinal mass. It's sublumar lymph node. But you can tell in this lymph node, I mean, you, and this was not a great image after I put it up here. I looked at it. But what I was looking for was this density right here. I mean, you can see this kind of, kind of just fairly consistent. It's a little bit stippled, but fairly consistent. I mean, thymomas will just have these big old lytic kind of weird areas, real dense here, real almost white, really black here, kind of gray here. I mean, they just look a lot different than that when you find those masses. The real... Uh, gold standard for telling the difference between the two is actually getting a sample. And again, this is the old flow cytometry I talked about come back up. Now if you're doing an ultrasound you see this big mass in the chest, oftentimes you can put a needle in there and get a few cells. The problem with it is that if I send that to a pathologist, again, we have that human error factor. He has to look at that and go, well, there's a lot of thymomas that have lymphocytes in them, and there's some lymph nodes that will have some lower grade, smaller lymphocytes in them. Is that lymphoma or is that just inflammation? And that can be hard. And I have a lot of problems, some, some, problems sometimes with, with getting pathologists to call lymphoma versus thymoma. And this study looked at flow cytometry. What they look for is that staining pattern. Most of, your, uh, most of your thymomas will actually be positive for CD4 and CD8. They'll co-express that. And most of your lymphomas will not. They'll either express neither one of these or one of these. And so when we looked at flow cytometry, I think the combination of what I would say my way to tell the difference now is, is that we, look, we put the probe on there and we say, is this thing cystic? Is this not cystic? Is this heterogeneous? We poke it while we're looking at it. And then we can send that out and go, how did it stain out for us? If we come back and go, it's really heterogeneous, it's, it's got some cystic areas, they're, they're uniformly staining for CD4 and CD8, that dog's got a thymoma. I mean, that's the way I would look at it. Uh, if, if you're getting a real solid mass, it's not huge, it's not staining out right, then I would start to think that this guy's got lymphoma. Now, there is another way you can tell the difference. And the other way is you treat the dog for lymphoma for two weeks and you see if it goes away. Because most of these mediastinal masses, you give them a dose of L-spar, it's not gonna hurt him. I mean, it's, you're spending a little bit of money. If it's a thymoma, it's gonna sit there, it's not gonna do anything, it's not gonna respond to that L-spar. You put them on steroids, it, it's gonna sit there, it's probably not gonna do much. Those thymomas are not rapidly gonna respond. Whereas your, your response rate with mediastinal lymphoma is similar to those that we see with these, these these multicentric nodal lymphomas, I mean, you're going to see 80-90% of those guys go whoop and really draw down. And you can tell that off an x-ray. You can take a dog and give him pred for a few days and see if that thing starts to reduce down. And if it does start to really significantly get smaller, thymomas really don't do that. I mean, they accumulate, they get big, they're going to be solitary masses. For all, all intents and purposes, I would say I'm probably, if I look at all the cases I'll see in this year, we'll ultrasound most of them because we're diagnosing it. But I will have some owners that will select to just go ahead and start treatment for a week or so and see if they respond. If they do, great, we know we're on the right track. We medically diagnosed you basically with lymphoma. If you're not responding, then we're kind of reverting back and going, you know, I think this is a thymoma. It's a 
roundabout way to get there, but I'll be honest with you, it's the real world, and that's oftentimes we will make that decision to start treatment. You're not going to hurt the thymoma if he gets a couple doses of chemotherapy, especially if he's getting Pred or a dose of L-Spar. I mean, those are super, super well-tolerated medications. So no standard treatment, though, if you do have mediastinal lymphoma. But a CHOP-based protocol is what I usually use, um, <clears throat> especially if we think it's bigger, a part of a bigger process. A lot of times they are T-cell rich. You'll see this real common theme over the next couple slides, just like cutaneous, adding in your lomustine early on. Certainly may improve your survival times. This is one of those scenarios where radiation can be beneficial if you have a solitary mass. So again, this is one of those variations of almost a Hodgkin's-like lymphoma where it's very isolated to that, that solid mass in the middle of the chest. Prognosis varies greatly, but is, is often going to be reduced to some degree at least because dogs will have that, that hypercalcemia and it's just a higher stage of disease. But I do see a lot of guys with mediastinal lymphoma go on and do very, very well if they're responding and, and, and having an optimal response to treatment. Uh, the only reason that prognosis will be quoted in papers to be reduced is because some of them are sick and the, the response rate can vary depending on how sick you are. But uh, most of the time I start with chemotherapy. I don't jump straight to radiation unless they're just not responding with it. And some of that is because we don't have it here yet. Uh, and other reasons for that is I like to make sure I'm targeting the whole body and not just that one spot in the middle of the chest. The final one that I'm going to mention just briefly is the central nervous system and, and CNS lymphoma. CNS lymphoma is usually an extension of just multicentric lymphoma. The disease has progressed, it's gotten big in the lymph nodes, um, it's entered into the bloodstream and now found its way to your brain. And you will see that manifest in a lot of different ways. The most common is just a depressed mentation. Um, you can see stuff like this, you can see seizures, you can see cranial nerve deficits. One of the other things I'll see is I'll see these ocular changes, just really, really bad uveitis. Even see just cloudiness that starts to develop into the interior chamber of the eye where you're getting a lot of disease building up in the body. This is considered a stage 5 condition. It's, it's similar to having it in your bone marrow. It's just, just meaning that disease is much more progressed. It does carry a guarded prognosis and a lot of that is due to clinical signs, but it's also due to the blood-brain barrier. If I look at all the drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier in dogs, then Christine doesn't cross it. Cyclophosphamide doesn't cross it. Dr. Rubison doesn't cross it. Pred does. So basically, in your CHOP protocol, only PRET is going to cross the blood-brain barrier and, and really have any high, high penetration into your brain. The biggest thing if you diagnose a dog with CNS signs that has lymphoma is you've got to make good drug selections. The first thing is trying to diagnose them. Now, I will say most of the time when I diagnose a dog with, with lymphoma in the CNS, it has nothing to do with any of the things on this slide. I mean, it's usually just you're looking at the dog, he's neurologic, and he's got lymphoma. But if you have a primary CNS lymphoma, which is really, really rare, but if you do and you're thinking that, these are really the ways you're going to get to it. The same thing you get to it for a lot of brain tumors. MRI, CSF tap, cytology. You will find typically an increased lymphocyte count or malignant lymphocyte count in the CNS if you do a tap. The MRI images, there's a couple studies that were done the last couple of years looking at MRI now for CNS lymphoma, diagnosing it. Big thing here is, is unless you do a lot of MRIs, these are, this is kind of a weird paper to read and it's, it's kind of hard to make heads or tails out of it. The thing is, is there are some things that are similar in dogs that have lymphoma that we don't notice with other brain tumors. I read this paper a couple times, not being a neurologist, and I had to think about it, and finally I figured out what to tell you because it took me a little bit to, to think about it. The take-home was when I read this was, it says all e lesions were of the T2-weighted images um, Basically, compared to the white matter, were hyper intense. Most were hypo intense and T1. That's not the important part. The important part was this: lesions margins. So the margin of the lesions were usually indistinct in two T weighted images. So what that means is, if you think about like a meningioma or glioma sitting in the uh, sitting in the brain, it's just perfect little round ball with these distinct edges right around it. When you think about lymphoma, you got this mass, and then it just kind of fades out. It's like an egg. you got the yolk and then the white just kind of spreads out around it. And it's just like if you had a mass in your intestine that was lymphoma. You may see an area of thickening, but it's going to have infiltration in that, in the, into that area around it. So with, with brain tumors that were lymphoma, you did see that. You saw that it wasn't this perfectly confined little mass. It had that haziness all around it. And so that's what they kind of kept going back to here. And they said that the majority of the lesions had abnormal meninges around the lesion. And that was their big kind of selling point on it. It's although not specific, but if you combine it with your history, neurologic signs, 
uh, probably the fact the dog had big lymph nodes at the same time, because you just don't see a lot of primary CNS, that it, it is diagnostic. But I think that is one of those things we look for is when we find a brain tumor, is, is, is it really confined or is it, does it have that haziness around it? Because that could indicate it's lymphoma. Remember, these are hard to obviously go in and biopsy or aspirate. So you really have to start thinking like, how can I get that diagnosis? The, the CNS TAF, after you do that, oftentimes you will get an increased lymphocyte count and that can be your, confirm your diagnosis. But again, the take home is, if you're neurologic and you, and you already know it has lymphoma, those are gonna be the more common ones you see. Drug selection is the biggest key for me. When I'm picking drugs, I have to think about what crosses that blood-brain barrier. Molecule size of drugs are not equivocal and not all drugs, even the good ones, cross the blood-brain barrier. These are going to be the big ones we think about. So that cytosine arabinoside that was in that co-app, this is where you'd like to pull it out and use it. You can give it IV, you can actually give it intrathecal, you can actually give it into the cord. Um, Lomustine crosses the blood-brain barrier. Procarbazine that's in that MOP protocol crosses the blood-brain barrier, prednisone. But if you just jump to a standard CHOP protocol with a dog with CNS lymphoma, you may get his lymph nodes down, but he's probably still stumbling because you just can't get a lot of drug in that area to get it under control. You have to just make these, these minor changes to your drugs, and, and most of those dogs will respond and do well. Radiation therapy has been used, and, and lymphoma, again, is just super responsive to radiation. When you combine it with systemic chemotherapy, you will see an improved response. Um, I don't do a ton of that for CNS patients. I mean, most of the time, if I'm picking the right drugs, they'll respond, they'll get in remission, and they'll do fine without radiation. Uh, so, so drugs are chemotherapy is, is usually the, the course I go for CNS. The overall response rate, it's going to be, it's going to vary, but I would say my clinical impression is about six to nine months. I think that these dogs don't do as well as your, as your standard, uh, just isolated to lymph nodes, CHOP protocol, B-cell lymphoma that's going to be 12 to 12 months to a year and a half down the road. Six to nine months is considered what I, I really lean for for them. Uh, I think you can get them remission. I think they can do really well, but that's the time frame I talk to owners about. I have seen some long-term survival time, particularly uh, if you look at and we didn't talk a lot about cats tonight, but if you look at cats that come in that may be diagnosed with CNS involvement, it is much more common for a cat to de with lymphoma to develop CNS involvement. The reason for that is they have typically a pretty high blood supply leaving their, their kidneys, their liver that goes up to their brain, have a real high blood supply connection there. So if cats have significant GI lymphoma that's progressed into their liver or their kidneys, it's not uncommon for them to have it progress into their brain. I've seen a lot of cats that come in stomach having trouble standing, rolling on the floor, having a seizure, that go on, we treat them with appropriate drugs that cross the blood brain barrier, they get in remission, they do well, and they stay there for a long time. And some of my, my long-term cat survivors have actually had CNS signs when they come in. A lot of times it's underdiagnosed, people just don't notice it, but their cats are having like this real suppressed mentation and things like that, and they think they're just lethargic because they didn't eat, but they may actually have CNS involvement. So the, the, the long-term survival has been reported, and certainly in cats I think you, uh, you know, I think you can look at that and go, these guys can still do well. Dogs, it's, it's, it is reduced though. Dogs, you probably will see more of like six to nine months. A lot of information. I think it's a lot of good information. I think it's a common disease and, and certainly we're just tapping on a lot of stuff. But as you can see, there, there's new stuff on the diagnostic side and new stuff on the treatment side. And I think, you know, I think the future for lymphoma is looking a lot better than it did four or five years ago. And with some of these new things like that vaccine, I'm, I'm hoping that this time next year I'm telling you even more uh, exciting statistics about it. Uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thanks.